he is just about the only person on this planet who could do what needs to be done to save this country, to save the world right now. We've been attacked every single day, having systems get weaponized against you, the press go after you. My father was impeached twice. Our two children almost saw their grandfather get assassinated on live TV. <laughs> gets up and he does that iconic moment, fight, fight, fight. I'm not sure if I've ever seen something motivate a country as much as that moment did. What would have happened if that had been successful? It feels like America got a second chance. The greatest comeback will be this November when he wins the election for the second time. Are we good to go? Eric, Lara, first of all, thank you so very much for, for joining me and for having me at your beautiful, what's well, part of your home, so thank you. Yeah. Well, welcome to Palm Beach. Thanks for joining thank us. You. Oh my gosh, I can yeah. do this weekly, it's incredible. <laughs> uh, I wanted to start by asking you, Eric, what it's like to be married to one of the most powerful women in America oh. right now. Good question. That is a good question. <laughs> you know, she's, she's never ceased to, to amaze me. Uh, unbelievable mom, unbelievable wife. Uh, went in, you know, unbelievable TV career, and then went into the RNC, which is, you know, really the Republican Party, and just totally dismantled it and really brought it back to life in, in an amazing way. I mean, went into an apparatus that was old and kind of established and, and went in and raised more money than they've ever seen mm -hmm. before and put a beautiful kind of face to it. And believe me, under, underneath this beautiful smile, there's a, there's a killer in there. And, uh, <laughs> and, and she can do it with grace and poise. And um, I don't think there's any better spokesperson for the party. I don't think there's any better spokesperson for our family. And um, she's an amazing mom, amazing wife. Thanks, honey. Very tough, um, but just an incredible person. That's so nice. This might be hard to answer, but out of the two of you, who do you think is more important to your father's chances of oh. winning office again? That is, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, listen, she has to raise a, a billion dollars, right? And she's, she's well on her way. Right. And she, she has to focus on election integrity. And I don't think there's anything more important in the yeah. world than yeah. election integrity. So, no, she's, um, he loves her. He adores her. He always says, I just need a hundred more Laura's on TV. If I have a hundred more Laura's on TV, he'll, he'll tell senators, you know, watch her, you know, like watch, I want you to learn from her. You know, that, that's how you do it. That's how the party's represented. But no, she's, um, you know, arguably, I think maybe the most important female in Republican politics right now. And so it's- That's uh, shocking. It's big, big, big shoulders to, uh, you know, big shoulders. It's great. How does that sit with you? Or how does it feel to hear your husband describe you like that? Oh, that's very, it's very nice. It's very humbling. I mean, Aaron, I never expected any of this. You know, mm. I come from very average background in America. I grew up, I think like most Americans grew up. I come from a middle-class family. My parents were small business owners. And I can assure you, I never expected to have the last name Trump, let alone to get as involved as I have in American politics and now to be co-chair of the RNC. And then of course, to have the weight of representing this incredible family and a family that truly, um, were they anything less than worthy, I never would have in 2016 come out and campaign for my father-in-law the way that I did. And, and that's really why I started. Um, so I'm humbled, I'm honored, and um, he, he's a smart guy because he knows who uh, sleeps next to him at night and, <laughs> and who cooks him nice meals sometimes too. You. Yeah. <laughs> I promise I'll get into more substantial questions in just a second, but when I first spoke to you, I asked you how you met Eric and, and what attracted you to him initially, and she said your height. <laughs> <laughs> True. I'd love to know what your first impression oh. of her was. Uh, tall, beautiful. Um, I love the fact that she's from the South. There's great warmth in, in the United States. Might not translate over to, to Australia, but there's a great warmth to, to this kind of the Southerners in the United States. They're nice, very kind of, you know, homey. Um, and she was beautiful and um, she had everything going for her. She really did. You know, she had an amazing career. Um, she was so many different personalities. She could be so many different, um, you know, people. You know, she had a great culinary career. You know, she had a great kind of media career that she was working on. Um, and then obviously all of a sudden she gets thrown into politics and does an unbelievable job and wins North Carolina, which was her home state uh, for my father in 2016 and becomes such a great spokesperson and obviously takes on this major role and um, everything she's ever done, she's succeeded in and, and succeeded in a very big way. And so um, maybe I saw a little glimpse of that very long time ago, 2008. It's kind of hard to believe. Oh, look at you with your dates. That's pretty good. Uh, that's got to win me some kind of we'll point. We'll take right? that. Just, you know, at least I got the year right. And for me, it was the height. 
So <laughs> that was a lot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the only thing you can't control is yeah. that. Um, you make the point about maybe you saw a, a hint of what was to come. When you spoke at the convention so brilliantly, you spoke about the fact that Donald Trump believed in you before you believed in yourself. What was it like to have someone like him endorse you in that way? Oh, I mean, it's uh, unbelievable, you know, to to have someone with the the elevated status of Donald Trump with I mean, this is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. He's so smart. He he's he's so great at so many different things and in so many different aspects of his life. This is a businessman. This is a, a media mogul, a politician. Although he hates the the term politician whenever you talk to him about it. To know that that he believed in me to do things like initially I, I talked about in my RNC speech to win my home state of North Carolina for him. You know, to me, I was just this kind of um, you know southern girl who lost my way found my way to New York, and here was this man who not only was so powerful and so many people obviously knew his name, but to me also my father-in-law. And it sort of ups the ante a little bit, I think, whenever it's family. And when this is a person who you have immense respect for and, and love, and to know that, that someone who could have chosen anyone in the world to do a job chose me to do it and believed in me enough to say, you know, go do it, I know you can do this. Um, there's no better encouragement and there's there's just there's nothing more powerful to have behind you than that endorsement and that strength and so I can tell you uh, every word of it I said in my speech I meant there have been so many times in my life where I needed just a little extra and it's amazing how he always kind of has shown up at those times he may not even know it phone calls to me moments he's kind of stopped by our house uh, when he probably will never know how much it meant to me and obviously to put this, put me in this role and give me uh, the opportunity that I've had here at the RNC, incredible and, and above and beyond anything I could have ever dreamt. There's many ways in which you are not a normal family that are quite obvious, the fame, the wealth, the power, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm sure there are ways that you would be exactly like the rest of us at home with kids in day-to-day -day lives. What is your kind of normal life like? Yeah, well, we, we're very normal in that. I mean, look, every day, it, life, is, life is crazy for everybody, I feel like, especially when you have kids. And I think it's a priority for us, you know, like so many parents and so many families, we want to do everything we can to prioritize our kids, to make sure, and especially for us, we want our kids to have a very normal upbringing. You know, I, I think they know something is a little different with grandpa because they see him on TV a lot but they know him as grandpa and they love him because he's grandpa and for no other reason. And so look, uh, last night our, our son wasn't feeling well. So he slept at the foot of our bed on our little couch there just, <laughs> and I got no sleep because every second I heard something, I'm like, is he okay? Yeah. It's we're, we're like any other family. I rush in the morning to get the kids up and ready to school and every chance I can drop them off at school, pick them up from school, take them to gymnastics, soccer, basketball, jujitsu. Mm -hmm. I want to be there for them and do that. And then, you know, the times on the weekends that we get to spend together are really important. And we have uh, a Sunday family tradition. And every Sunday- What's that? Every Sunday night. You want to tell dinner. me? Yeah. Yeah, we get together every Sunday night. It's really the four of us have a great dinner. It's almost become we didn't even start it on purpose. I don't know it just, how it happened, it just developed but it's always it's... just the four of us. We I want just that. a family, you know, any any other people that are around, we're like, you know, this so is if, our time. If Donald arrives, say, <laughs> 8 p.m. on a Friday. Get out of here. Yeah, it gets us just <laughs> us. Just, just us. Yeah, no, I love that. But it's special, and, and the kids look forward to it, and they know that that's our special time together. And no matter how crazy life gets, we always have... Sunday nights to look forward together, uh, to together, to just be a normal family. Yeah, I love that. Um, Donald is a grandpa. We've spoken about this. Um, do you look, Eric, at how he is with your kids and go, I wish he was that soft with me when I was younger? <laughs> <laughs> There's no question. Um, well, first of all, he's an amazing father to, to me and to Don, Imanka, Baron, Tiffany, uh, an amazing guy. I'd go into his room every day before going to, sleep, before going to school. He'd always say, Eric, no drinking, no drugs, no smoking. No drinking, no drugs, no smoking. And as a five-year-old kid, six-year-old kid, I'm sitting there saying, what the hell is drinking, what's, <laughs> yeah. what's drugs, what's smoking? And yeah. he wanted to impress some, you know, that upon us. Um, we are on construction sites when we were you know, 11, 12 years old. He wanted us to learn how to work with our hands, understand kind of the building blocks of real estate. You know, that's obviously the industry we're in, yeah. uh, the business we're in. And hey, you better be able to pull conduit. You better be able to you know, do tile work and, and masonry work. And you know, he expected us to, to learn the value of a dollar. Um, 
get to know the people you know who worked on the ground and, and, and put their blood, sweat, and tears into projects. Um, and it was the most valuable thing we yeah, ever did. So, um, and he expected us to do damn well in school, right? There was no games. There was, do well in school. You're going to work really hard. You're going to understand the value of a dollar. Um, no games on the side. And uh, my father raised really five and my mother, but you know, five great yeah. kids. There's no problems. There's no Hunter Bidens. There's no you know, excessive drug use. There's no, you know, crazy laptops, right? The laptop from hell that we call it. We never had that with any of us. I mean, we we're hard workers. Uh, we came into the company. Uh, we built some of the greatest buildings all around the world, some of the greatest hotels around the world. Um, you know, and, and every chance we had represented our country well, represented our family well. Um, and uh, he's just a remarkable man, and he really instilled values in us. Um, he instilled manners in us. Uh, there's no better father um, a child could have had. And by the way, not to interrupt, but my favorite thing at the convention was when Kai spoke yeah. and she said, he likes to give us candy and sodas <laughs> because it's the, it's so funny. You know, you asking Eric that question, yeah. I always know whenever they've been around grandpa, cause they're like, we got extra candy. And I'm like, oh, I know, I know what's happening. He's a typical grandpa in that yeah. respect. And I think that's, I, I wish people saw that side of him. You know, I tried to convey it in my speech, but, but this, is, this is a guy who has literally the weight of the world on his shoulders, who has people attacking him constantly, who has so many distractions. And yet the moment when our kids walk in the room, it's the only thing he wants to do. He wants yeah. to be with them. He wants to give them as much candy as he can and then send them back to us. Um, <laughs> but but that, was, that was my absolute favorite part of the whole convention. I love that, I love yeah. that. No, you did actually convey that beautifully. It was really, True. really powerful. And it's hard to do that sometimes as well. Um, looking at what's at stake for your country, and, and I say your country, but what I mean is the world, and particularly for us in Australia, because we rely heavily on the US. And whilst we may not be as big and, and powerful as you guys are, or have the defence force capabilities that you have, I think in terms of where we're located, that there's a lot that we have to offer. What will Donald Trump do in the White House that will ensure that China will not invade Taiwan, that World War III doesn't break out in the Middle East, that Russia doesn't continue into Ukraine, what, what will he do? American weakness has created the biggest void in the world, and, and that's because you have a weak administration. There were no games under my father, right? You had peace in the Middle East, you had no Russia-Ukrainian conflicts. I mean, you know, the, the world was at peace. My father was trying to get America out of every war. He didn't want wars. He wanted to have the strongest military on, on the face of this earth in case we ever had to use it, but he didn't want wars, right? He wants the greatest economy, he wants the greatest education. He wants safe borders. Very practical. He wants common sense. We don't have common sense as a world right now. And, and honestly, the vacuum that's become this administration, you know, the Biden-Harris administration, has just created turmoil all over the place. Um, China does want to invade Taiwan. There's no question about it. Uh, well, they he also said it. They, Xi has said it multiple times. They also want to become the superpower of the world. They want to become, yeah. you know, the worldwide currency, the most powerful. They want to become the worldwide language. They want to control every major industry that's important, whether it be you know, telecommunications, they want to win the war without ever firing a shot. That is absolutely in their intent. And you, know, you have an administration here in the US that cares more about you know, whether or not six foot five men, you know, men my height should be able to swim in, in women's sports. That's what preoccupies their time. Their eyes are not focused on the prize. They're, they're not focused on the fact that you have adversaries around the world that want to take the number one spot and, and we can't let them. My father's very different, right? He's, he's the ultimate competitor. He wants to win at absolutely everything we do. He wants America to be number one at everything we do. And in turn, it's a great thing for the rest of the, the, the world, right? It, it creates prosperity, it creates economic prosperity, but, but beyond anything, it creates you know, peace. And, and, and America's had that role for a very long time. Biden's not, and Kamala, they're not solving these problems. They're not, they're not speaking to Putin. They're not trying to resolve conflicts, in fact, they're doing everything they can to work around these people because they realize nothing will get done. But, but Eric, Kamala was sent to Europe to stop Russia invading. Yeah, yeah, two days How'd before. That go? And then Putin laughed at her. But you know, she was also supposed to be the borders are, and we've had 13 million people mm -hmm. come across our southern border. We've had 300,000 kids that have died of fentanyl poisoning in this country, and no one's doing a damn thing about it. Aaron, our family is the last people they need to be doing this, right? I run beautiful clubs like this all over the world. We've got the best hotels on, on planet Earth. We've got the best golf properties on planet Earth. We've got some of the best commercial buildings. I mean, trust me, the, the last thing our family needs to be doing is, is getting shot at every single day, uh, having systems get weaponized against you, being attacked ruthlessly, having, having the press go after you. My father was impeached twice. He won both times. There's dirty dossiers that were made up that were totally phony. 
Everybody knows that story, Russia collusion. I mean, we don't know anybody in Russia. How, how could you possibly? We've been attacked every single day. They've tried to bankrupt our family. They've tried to separate our family. And we're still fighting. We, we don't need to be doing this. Donald Trump is, is the only politician probably in American history who, who lost zeros off the back of his name as opposed to gained many zeros, right? Unlike his, the predecessor, unlike the Clintons and the Obamas and so many others who became wealthy through this job. My father does it because he cares about America. He cares about red, white, and blue. And he's absolutely sick and tired of, of the incompetence um, in the country, incompetent leadership that's causing so many problems around the world. And, and that's why we as a family fight every single day. Not that we need to. Not that sometimes it's even fun too. Right. But, but because we, we truly care. We, we truly care. We love this nation. Um, and we can bring prosperity to it. My father, my father put together the biggest tax cuts in the history of this nation. I mean, the best job markets, the lowest interest rates, the lowest inflation we've ever seen. We had the lowest gas prices in the history of, of this country, lowest utility bills. You know, manufacturing was coming back to America. We had secure borders, you know, drug prices, illegal drug prices were by far the highest they had ever been. So the drug use was the lowest it had ever been. And, Literally, in a matter of you know three year period, all of those factors reversed. I mean, every quantifiable factor went went backward, um, and we can take it back, and we can do so very quickly. And I'm confident we're going to do that on on November fifth. Did you try and convince him not to go again, either of you? Did you think this is just too hard basket, as you said, we don't need this as a family? No, no. And by the way, even if we try to, <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell not you, Aaron, it, really it, wouldn't, have it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked. I mean. He's hell bent on the mission, and, and the one thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, that stubbornness is beautiful. You know, his his entire career was kind of built off of the back of being stubborn and having backbone, um, and being, you know, non politically correct. Um, you know, once he sets his eyes on something, he goes for it, and he's relentless in that pursuit. And I think that's a beautiful thing. He was relentless in the pursuit when he was in business. He was relentless in, in his pursuit when he. Did the Apprentice for 14 seasons, which I was on for you know for many years. He just he focused on something and, and he just went after it. And he's been relentless in his pursuit of of saving this nation and saving our country and really um, you know making sure that you know the Western world remains free and strong um, and prosperous. And um, there's no talking him out of it. Believe me, it would have been very easy to fold <laughs> the cards. It would have been very easy to say, you know what, I'm sitting in another sham courtroom right now. Um, you know, how about this? It would be the easiest deal for me to ever make to go to them and say, how about you guys just brush this aside and, you know, we'll sit back. You guys, you guys just run your candidate. They would have loved that. They would have made that deal all day long and he would have never done it. Um, he is hell bent on winning. Um, he is working harder than anyone. I mean, he works tirelessly. Uh, and again, we're going to win this election. I always say that Donald Trump was made for such a time as this. Yeah. And I've said that for a long time. Um, but I actually think after July 13th, he gets it now too in that way. You know, when Eric talks about him being relentless and being stubborn, he means that in the best possible way. That's what made him such a successful businessman. That's what made him the household name, not just here in America, but around the world. That ability never to quit, never to give up. And I think after July 13th, what he realized is that there is a bit of a divine nature to this. I don't think you would have a conversation with Donald Trump right now and have him not tell you that it was God who saved yeah. his life, that he is only here today by the grace of God. And because of that, I think his drive in this election is as strong, but maybe has changed a little bit in the way that he is looking at it. I do think that he understands that he is just about the only person on this planet who could do what needs to be done to save this country, to save the world right now. And I think he really feels like he has God on his side. And when you talk about the importance of Donald Trump worldwide and why having him in the White House here in America is so impactful around the world, the things for which this man is often criticized, his tone, his tenor, his bravado, the way he presents himself sometimes, his, his tweets, all of those things, I actually feel like are the very reasons that he was such an effective leader when it came to people like Xi Jinping, when it came to the Ayatollah in Iran, when it came to Vladimir Putin, when it came to crossing the DMZ to shake hands with Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Mm. It's because of who Donald Trump is and the things that, that all the people like to attack him for, 
that America really was strong, respected, and the entire world was stabilized. Absolutely. I'd love to know from both of you, the one thing that's either been said about him or written about him that has hurt you or angered you the most. It hurts sometimes more, I think, as family member when, when they attack somebody that you love more than it hurts when they attack you. Know, they attack you. Um, yeah, I, I, I have that. to say though, Aaron, we became numb to it very quickly. Um, my, father sat us, my father sat us down very early on and he goes, kids, we're, <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run for president. And he said two really insightful things. You know, first of all, we're going to know who our friends are. Um, and, and B, we're going to get hit in ways you can't even comprehend. You know, you, you just wait. And it, it was unbelievable kind of foresight. I mean, that, that intuition um, w was amazing. I mean, he just he, he predicted a lot of what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, we didn't necessarily know how, but he predicted that we were going to get hit. And, you know, shortly after him coming down that escalator, we, we quickly became numb to the attacks. I mean, I'm a guy who's never gotten a speeding ticket, and I got 110 subpoenas by Congress and, you know, I mean, every Democratic senator, I mean, they wanted to make our lives hell. It was legal lawfare. They started putting us through it. I mean, we got parodied by every single, I mean, I'm running one of the biggest real estate companies on planet Earth, building some of the greatest hotels around the place, and we were parodied on shows like Saturday Night Live as, as if we were idiots, you know, playing with fidget spinners. And, yeah. um, you know, they did everything they could to demean us, uh, to undermine us, uh, to try and laugh at us. And honestly, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm not, maybe I'm not even proud of it, but it, it makes you emotionally numb um, to nonsense. Um, and maybe it is a good thing because I think you actually focus on, on, on kind of the mission at hand and you can you know, wipe out a lot of the nonsense. But people come up to us all the time. How do you handle it? And how do you handle the constant attacks? How do you handle the legal lawfare? Um, and you know, you wake up and you just punch back. And, and that's been the last 10 years of our life, just punching back. And um, I think America's really respected that. I think the whole world has respected that. And, you know, Laura touched on this a second ago, but I think maybe his greatest attribute you know, sometimes you think about what you want written on your tombstone when, when you're gone. And I think 10 years ago would have been great builder, great developer, you know, mm -hmm. guy who redefined skylines. You're fired. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe you're fired. I, I think today it's, it's somebody who is just, you know, relentless in the pursuit of whatever they put their eyes on, but, but also an unbelievable fighter, an unbelievable champion, a, a person who never backs down no matter how great the adversity. You had the famous Dana White, who runs the UFC, and I know Australia loves UFC, and he's been there many times. Um, but he goes, listen, I'm in the tough guy business, and I've never seen a tougher guy. I've never seen a greater fighter, and um, I truly believe that in my heart. I mean, no one could have gone through what Donald Trump went through, mm. and very few people could have gone through the attacks. You know, for every 1% that you report on on TV, there's 99% in the background that you'll never see. Um, and we wake up every day, and we keep on fighting. Yeah. Um, and we've done so very effectively. And, you know, I think the greatest, he wrote two books, The Art of the Deal and The Art of the Comeback. I think the greatest comeback will be this November when he wins the election for the second time. Uh, it's yet to come, the greatest comeback. Uh, what hurts you the most that people say, or are you similar to Eric in that you actually don't really absorb any of it? Yeah, I mean, I th it, was, it was a tough learning curve for me on this because I, I don't come from a background of a, a famous last name. And Eric and I got married only really like six months before my father-in-law entered politics. So we got a very short period of time of, of some normalcy. Yeah, like what's really normal when you're marrying into the Trump family? But we stayed married. That's a good yeah, start. Yeah, well, so we'll take uh, honey, that. we're extremely normal. Come on, please. We'll, we'll take it. Um, but initially, it was, it was very hard for me to see the things um, said about him and then said about us, you know, because they, of course, they attack us. They lie about us. One of, one of the most upsetting things for me, honestly, has to do with Eric. Um, Eric, at 22 years old, when most kids were out partying and having a good time, decided life had been so great to him. He wanted to give back, and he started a charity for the most deadly childhood diseases in the world and cancers and he raised money for St. Jude Children's Hospital which is the absolute best in the world at what they do had the lowest expense ratio of any private charity in America and I've seen Eric negotiate multiple business deals over the 16 years we've been together I've never seen him work harder than to get pennies off of a dollar because he knew that money would go to the kids of St. Jude and then to see how quickly once politics became part of our life People attacked him and, and just flat out lied about him with this. They still do it. They still post it on, on all of our social media. Um, it, it's just, it's sick and it, it, it is hurtful. 
and I might not be as as easy, it might not be as easy for me to block out out as it is for Eric. But I think what you ultimately find is that you realize the people who actually know you are the ones who really matter, and you have to block out all the rest. And then I think really you kind of use the haters, Aaron, as fuel. Like sometimes that's that's a drive. You know, they might think that they're deterring us from doing something. In fact, you are actually adding to my want to achieve whatever it is and, and my drive to achieve whatever that is. So um, it's actually probably had the inverse effect. And I think we've had to have that realization and adapt in that way. Otherwise, how do you survive in an environment like this? So it took me a little longer, but ultimately, look, we're, we're so blessed. We have an incredible family. We have great friends, true people around us who love us because they know us. And you very quickly have to realize that anyone outside of that really doesn't matter. It's almost like sport. I was a sports host for 10, 15 years before I moved into this space. And I know you were very athletic at yeah. school and it's that kind of motivation when a player, yes. you know, what, what do you guys call it here? Like we call it like talk or like yeah, trash, trash, talk. trash, 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 talk. Talk. Yeah, trash talking. Alliteration, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. I like your way more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it kind of motivates you. Um, I want to talk about um, the assassination attempt, if I may. And just hearing you talk about your father and, I mean, the way you talk about him too, is it, it reminds me of how I feel about my dad. And we lost dad last year to cancer, which is obviously um, so many people go through and really, really hard. Um, but yeah, so I get emotional just even thinking about it because, and it feels very similar to how you feel about your dad is how I felt about mine. Um, how did that feel to watch that almost happen? And, does it replay in your mind still? Do you still have moments where you think, what if, and, and how does that feel? So we stayed home um, that Saturday. We were going to be in, in, in Wisconsin for the convention. We wanted to spend the last couple of days, you know, last effectively day with our kids. And so we were sitting there watching him on TV as he, as he took the stage. You know, our kids were effectively on our lap. And um, he gets up on stage, and I'm writing an email on my laptop, and, and I hear the shots. And I've done a lot of competitive shooting. I know that world very, very well. And, uh, instantly knew what it, what it was and you know sure enough he was down on the ground grabbing his the side of his head with you know blood flowing down the side of his cheeks and um you know i think kind of you know the, the rest is history and they're sitting there saying hey did he get shot in the torso did he get shot in the abdomen is you know, how many because there was a lot of shots that, that, were, that were fired and, and obviously there's blood uh, and he's wearing a dark suit i mean he didn't know where he was hit and he's laying on the ground and he was down for um, maybe 45 seconds with you know, 20 secret service agents on top of him and then he gets up and he does that iconic moment fight 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 and I'm telling you I'm not sure if I've ever seen something motivate a country as, as much as that moment did I mean that just epitomized who he is and, and that's only not you, you can never script that you can never I mean that's pure instinct when when he came up but it, it was a horrible moment I mean our two infant children uh, maybe not infants but you know six and four at the time um, you know they pretty much almost saw their grandfather get assassinated on on live tv you know at a, at a young age sitting on our lap on a, on a beautiful afternoon and you know so you went from sadness hurt um, to pure anger in a, a very short period of time I'm not sure if I've ever seen that range of, of emotion it's you know how could a madman be left on a roof at 130 yards how, how could that have possibly happened you have agencies over here that you know spend billions of dollars every single year to not allow crazy people on roofs with with rifles you know how in the hell could that possibly happen and um, I'll never forget my father called me from, called all of us from the hospital, you know, about an hour later and he's about to go have a, a CAT scan and um, he said, he goes, nothing changes, we go to Milwaukee tomorrow. Exact same right time away. as we're going to go, we go to Milwaukee tomorrow. The fact and that he was thinking about that yeah. in the midst of, of literally being shot, at, but he was like, the show goes on, we're going wow. forward. I'm, I actually, he had not planned to go to Milwaukee on Sunday, but he said, we're going on Sunday. We're wow. going tomorrow. Yeah. And I'll tell you for, from my perspective, obviously you say, does it replay in your head? Of course it replays in your head. It's, it's shocking and it's very upsetting. And I think you talk to anyone in America who watched that it, it's jarring for all of us. And I think oftentimes about what would have happened, what would that have meant for this country yeah. if that had been successful? And then the next day on Sunday, you know, I felt like I had to talk to our kids about it because they were going to find out ultimately that something happened to grandpa. And that was probably the most challenging thing was to, to talk to a four and a six year old about somebody wanting to hurt their grandpa. And they don't understand why yeah. they don't understand any of this. And 
you could see our daughter actually at the convention. That was the first time they had seen lap. him. Yeah. She keeps looking up at his ear if you watch the video because <laughs> she. I said he's fine, Grandpa's yeah. fine, but he's got a bandage on his ear. And she had a lot of questions about it. And so the whole time she kept looking up at his ear <laughs> to make sure it was okay. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it really feels like America got a second chance. Obviously, Donald Trump will tell you he got a second chance at life. It feels like America got a second chance after that July 13th incident in Butler. There, there's no question. Things would be so much different if that had been a successful shot. You're both so good at this. And I don't say that just to compliment you, but you are uh, in terms of your ability to, to convey a message, to talk directly to people, to talk about complex things in a really straightforward way. It's not easy to do. Political aspirations for either <laughs> of you, surely, surely you, you've got even an iota somewhere. You start. <laughs> oh, they make it so nice for us, Aaron. Why wouldn't we want to do more of this? <laughs> Look, I, I think that all of us were so green in 2015 when, when my father-in-law came down that escalator and announced he was running for president. We were like, oh, this will be fun. This will be an, a nice time. And it is so brutal. These people are so ruthless. And it's actually so sad because it's a deterrent for good people to run for office. Absolutely. You know, you want great, smart people, successful people to do these jobs, to work for America, because that's ultimately what this is. You're not in there working for yourself, you're working on behalf of the people. And so I think that they, there has been a lot thrown our way, and I think for all of us in the family, we'd say we'd have to really think about that long and hard. Obviously, my focus right now is solely on November 5th, but what I've also learned with Donald Trump is you never say never to anything. Because yeah. if you would have asked me even a year ago, would I be the co-chair of the RNC? I would have said, I don't think so. Yeah. Would I be able to win North Carolina twice for Donald Trump? I would have said, I don't think so. But I would never say never to anything. I will say we will all need a nice long vacation after <laughs> November 5th though. Prior, prior yeah. to any, yeah. any person around. What about you? Yeah. You know, it's amazing. You see the best of a world and, and, the, and the worst of a world and you see them in kind of competing contrast, right? Um, he was asked about the assassination attempt. I mean, you see your father almost die, and then 48 hours later, exactly almost to the minute, you know, I'm the delegate from Florida who's making him the Republican nominee to president of the United States. So if you want to talk about highs and lows, we've, mm -hmm. we've seen them, and, and we've seen them in politics. We've had the greatest moments, the most iconic moments, standing in front of Air Force One. I mean, just the greatest symbol of maybe American might or being in the Oval Office. And, um, and then we've seen the lowest moments, right, where they ruthlessly attack you, drag through you through courtrooms just for their own kind of, you know, political lawfare. And, and um, I think we could all do it. Um, uh, we certainly have the voice. Uh, we certainly have the message. And, and I'm telling you, um, three quarters of America would, would run to the end of earth for, for Donald Trump. And um, the love out there is incredible. I mean, this isn't a politician. Uh, you know, because I think your family was like this. But this well, see, is, Dad was a major general who then went into politics because yeah. he wanted to serve. It, it's He's so much, not a politician. It's so much yeah. more. He created a movement, and it's a movement of love. It, when he walked out in the RNC that day, people are crying, right? I mean, people, it's a movement of love, something that's, that's rarely ever seen in, in politics. And I think we could do it. Um, at the same time, I can't emphasize kind of the, the toll it does, it does take. I mean, sometimes you sit there and say, is it worth it? And you wonder why you have career politicians in office, people who have been there for 55 years, who have never signed the front of a check, who are absolutely worthless, who don't understand the systems, who don't understand real real world. They're thrilled to get wined and dined every night by, by lobbyists yeah. and special interests and everything else. They're, they're thrilled to retire after you know uh, those years and go write books and make millions and move into you know the, these fancy neighborhoods, the same neighborhoods that they rallied against when they were in office. Um, uh, you know, it, it will be it will be interesting to see. We are going to need somebody to carry the torch for this country, and I will say that my father's created a, a new class of politicians who have backbone and who have loud voices and who aren't afraid to speak up. He's changed the Republican Party. She's changed the Republican Party in a massive way. I, I think maybe in a certain way we all have, uh, because we've been bold and we've had backbone and and we've marched into the fire every single time and we've been unrelenting. Um, as to whether or not one of us decides to do it and. Um, I, I truly believe we could, um, and maybe if the country really called on us, we would. Um, would it be I, president and vice? I, 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 <laughs> oh my I would, gosh. I would absolutely love They would it, love nothing more, Aaron, than two the Trumps way. on a ticket. Could you imagine? <laughs> People's heads would fully explode. That'd be hell of a ticket. That's perfect. That'd be I, love it, I love it. Uh, I'd love to ask you about Biden and Kamala. I've only been in the country for three or four days, but all I've seen is Joe Biden at the beach 
um, Kamala not doing too much at all, uh, particularly on the anniversary of the American troops mm. who were killed in Afghanistan. I saw your father and father-in-law with the families. I saw Joe Biden on a beach and I saw Kamala Harris's diary as empty. Why is he doing the job that the current administration should be doing tenfold? It's a disgrace to America. You have the anniversary of Abbey Gate, losing 13 incredible service members in, in Afghanistan, the worst withdrawal out of any war ever, the greatest embarrassment to America. We, we gave away 20 years of hard work and blood and sweat and tears, only to be totally embarrassed based on total incompetence. Um, and he's laying on a beach, and my father is laying a wreath at Arlington National Cemetery. I mean, really, kind of the, the epicenter of, of what you know, sacrifice really means. Um, America doesn't have a cheerleader right now. You know, my father was the greatest cheerleader. He'd come off the, the steps of Air Force One at 2 o'clock in the morning, and America is the greatest country on earth. We're the greatest superpower in the world. We have the best manufacturing. We have the best business community. We, you know, we have the lowest taxes. We do everything better. We have more oil. We have the most powerful military, right? Uh, America's the biggest, the strongest, the best. We don't have a cheerleader right now. There's no cheerleader. I mean, it, these people don't even have a voice. It's sometimes you, you wonder if they're actually even alive, even present. Um, aside from having awful policy, um, you have a vice presidential candidate right now, and Tim Walls, who literally campaigned on putting tampons in boys' bathrooms. I mean, I mean that was his campaign slogan, tampons in, in boys' bathrooms. You have people that are absolutely incompetent. And, on the flip side, you have a, a president, Donald Trump, who wants the lowest taxes, the lowest regulation. He wants absolute, he wants America to thrive, the greatest economy, you know, the lowest interest rates, the lowest food prices, the lowest gas prices, um, the best education. There's nothing more important. He wants us to lead the way in absolutely everything we do, whether it's in the business world, in the crypto world, in the technology world, in the medical space. I mean, he wants to lead the world in everything. Uh, we do, and, and he wants safety and security for the entire world. He wants a stable world. He doesn't want wars. He doesn't want nonsense. Um, he'll solve the problem in the Middle East in about two seconds. He's done it before. He'll bring peace to the Middle East. He'll solve the, the problem between Ukraine and, and Russia in about two seconds as well. You know, you see these innocent, beautiful kids on both sides. They're in, you know, you watch it on YouTube. You know, they, they walk around a corner in a trench and they shoot each other in the face. And, you know, America's sending hundreds of billions of dollars over to the fuel this nonsense. It's, it's infuriating. What, what are we doing? I mean, how about we invest in our kids? How about we invest in our future? How about we invest in things that are, are productive for, for society? But um, you need a tough, tough person in order to, to bring peace back to the world. And it's exactly what Donald Trump's going to do. And uh, I'm incredibly proud of him. Um, I'm a proud son. Um, he's represented us so well. Um, He's taken fire on like anything I could have ever possibly imagined, but um, he's going to bring safety back to the world and prosperity. And um, the slogan is make America great again. Put America first, make America great again. And it's exactly what he's going to do. Final question, and it's a quick one, and I actually am just curious myself, but you talk about how proud you are of him. And you spoke earlier, Lara, about how he can be unconventional in his methods sometimes. Are there ever any moments, because I know I had them with my dad sometimes too, where you go, oh, God damn it. Surely, are there we're not? human beings. <laughs> well, what's funny is, is any time that I have questioned, I'm like, what? Is, why is he doing this? What are you doing? Then I, it's like a six month year period, and I'm like, oh, it's actually, it's actually amazing. And I would not say it if it hadn't happened to me multiple times. But I even say to Eric, I'm like, your dad was right. Remember when this happened? And I said, why did he do that? He always comes back around. But yeah, of course, we're like any son or daughter-in-law. This is our, our, our dad and our yeah. you know, father-in-law. This is, it's normal. You didn't need to pick that fight. <laughs> that, that, that was one you could have probably left alone, you know, just as, as an advisor yeah. looking in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny as hell, right? Yeah. You know, and you know, yeah. listen, I think society's broken down into people, right? There's, there's, there's people who enjoy that, right? Yeah. Who, who enjoy kind of the spirit of somebody who's not willing to maybe let something go and will, will always throw the counter punch and, you know, I just kind of mentioned it, but like America's absent that fighter right now. And We're it's all, it's all president it, right it's, now. It's, it's almost the thing that he gets criticized for the most is actually the, the, the very characteristic like, attribute that actually made him so incredible. Is right? that his superpower? The, the essentially. fact that you, know, yeah. you, you couldn't tell Mike Tyson, you know, throw a, you know, a th throw a softer punch. He didn't know how to do it. He had one speed, but that's what made Mike Tyson the best of all time. You know, Donald Trump's very much the same way. I mean, he's a fighter and he's willing to stand up. Um, and people love the fact that he's willing to stand up. I mean, again, I, I truly believe that's his greatest attribute. And um, again, he's, he's made our family incredibly proud and uh, awesome guy, remarkable guy, I'm very proud of him.
Oh, it's incredible. Thank you both so very much. Thank Eric you. and Lara, so yeah. grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you.